Quick hello yes, while Greg is you. organizing have... our slide situation here. Um, I'm Mary Beth Collins. I'm from the Center for Community and Nonprofit Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And we are just so delighted you're all here with us to learn about revenue models and funds development from your respective organizations and work in our communities. Um, we have a few different speakers and folks that are gonna be giving intros today. So we're just making sure everything is settled for that and we'll get started officially any moment now. If you would like to write in the chat who you are and what community or organization you're coming from so that people know who are here and you know who they're learning with um, in this session and in the future series that we would invite you to do so. Greg, I've, I've got- Thank you my... for that, Mary Beth. Hmm. Okay, there we go. Um, well, as Mary Beth said, welcome. We are so excited to launch this Top Trends and Promising Strategies in Revenue Models and Funds Development. Uh, this is August 9th. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this session is the art and soul in funds development and the movement we're in preparing for current and future trends. We have some phenomenal speakers today and I know that you will be able to take some great things with you. The session logistics, uh, as Mary Beth mentioned, please share who you are, where you're coming from in the chats. Uh, We've got uh, UW-Madison in the house, Seattle, Washington, um, all over. Welcome so much. Uh, as we continue with the session, please feel free to ask any questions. I will be monitoring them. If you have any tech technical difficulties, please uh, just try leaving and rejoining the meeting. If that doesn't work, please just send me a message and we will work through that. Um, the session, as you know, is recorded and the recording will be shared with you at a later date, so you can use that to reference anything. And uh, the attached worksheets that Jessica sent, please use those uh, in the best way that serves you. Take notes throughout today's session, and uh, hopefully if you have any, or if you have any additional needs to the workshops or, or to the worksheets and you'd like them to be changed, please send me or Jessica a note. That'd be fantastic. Uh, and as Mary Beth said, I'm Greg Potter, me and Jessica will be your liaisons and your guides through the webinars in the next uh, seven webinars. And today we have Don Gray, former vice president of principal gifts at UW Foundation. And later Tony Shields will be joining us, president and CEO of Wisconsin Philanthropy Network. You heard from Mary Beth Collins already, the executive director of the Center of Community and Nonprofit Studies at UW Madison. And then Michael Johnson, the president and CEO of the Boys and Girls Club will be, of Dane County, will be chatting with Mary Beth in just a little bit. Uh, and now I would like to bring Mary Beth back to uh, welcome from the comments. Yes, thank you so much, Greg. Um, it is so exciting to see you all here from your respective communities and efforts that you're working on. We know how hard this work of figuring out a sustainable revenue model is and then implementing the tactics for fundraising and obtaining that revenue that you wanna have in your model. And we really hope that our Center for Community and Nonprofit Studies, what we sometimes refer to as the commons, um, can help you in that journey. And we're super excited to be partnering in this effort with the Association of Fundraising Professionals of Greater Madison. And in fact, the broader Wisconsin community of folks that are associated with the Association of Fundraising Professionals. A little background about our center and the reason why we're here today, kind of helping with this effort to bring this information your way. Uh, we are a center at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, we're kind of in the toddler phase of centers as these things go. We haven't been around all that long, but we are really growing fast. And we do research, outreach, and teaching related to civil society, the nonprofit sector, and community efforts. I'm gonna put a link to our website in the chat. Um, and historically, our center um, in, in, the la in the early days of its um, work um, had the opportunity to take on a facilitation role of a very popular conference that the business school had previously hosted 
which Don Gray, who's here with us today, was the founder of. And that was an in-person conference that people from all over the country would travel to Madison to attend. Again, very popular. Michael Johnson and other speakers are going to hear from in this series were speakers at that event. But when COVID occurred, uh, our dean really implored us to think about how we could turn that valuable experience into a more accessible virtual model that might get it um, the content in front of people that were not able to previously attend when travel to Madison was required. And we also wanted to make sure that we started to look at what the future of fundraising and development is likely to look like as we provide this content and make sure that we're addressing top trends. So what you're gonna to hear today to kick, out, kick off this series is a little bit about some of the legacy lessons that Don and others would really encourage you to think about from decades of work in the field. Don has an art and soul and funds development talk that he's given for many years that's always been very popular. Um, he's gonna share that with us. And then we're gonna pivot a little bit to looking at what are the trends that we expect to affect this field in the future. And then throughout this series, we're gonna to hope to equip you with tips, tactics, things to consider, things you can take back to your board and your staff and your work as a consultant or a development professional that you can help use in your uh, toolbox, essentially, to make sure that your organization has a sustainable plan for its resources and revenue. So that's a little background from our center. I hope you'll learn more about us um, through this series and in general. We're so glad you're here with us. And I'm gonna turn it over to um, Sarah of the Association of Fundraising Professionals to just say a little warm welcome from that organization. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome to this uh, first session of this wonderful series. I'm Sarah Lynn, the president of the Association of Fundraising Professionals, um, or AFP, Greater Madison Chapter. We are an inclusive community of professionals committed to promoting ethical fundraising and philanthropy by building or providing networking and professional development opportunities. Uh, and we're so proud to be partnering with you for this webinar series this year. Um, if you're looking for ongoing professional development opportunities related to fundraising or the nonprofit sector, I'm inviting you to come and check out AFP. We've got a calendar of upcoming events at afpmadison.org. We can put that in the chat too. Um, you'll find coffee chats, panel discussions, opportunities to learn from experts, our local experts, and then also well beyond that. Um, we typically have several events each month, so there should be something there for you, and we'd love to have you come out to something soon. Uh, thanks again for joining us today, and I'm looking forward to this series with you. Thank you so much, Sarah, for adding that little. We're so excited to have AFP with us for this journey. Uh, now I'd love to introduce Don Gray, and he is going to take it off. Okay, uh, Greg, I, I can't, I can't get my uh, my program up. There we go. Yep. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this series, which we hope will be of great benefit to you. My name is Don Gray, and I've been in this business for about half of my life, which means about forty years. So uh, it's a real joy for me to have the opportunity to talk with all of you. The opening session here is called The Art and Soul of Nonprofit Development. And what we want to stress is that there's a, several different ways of looking about how we go about doing what we go. Uh, and I, I, I can't, I don't have control of the screen, Greg. There, uh, there we go. There go. Okay. Do, do I have it now? You should. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll know after this first slide. Okay, okay the standard model, if you, look, you go into the internet and go on to uh, uh, Google in something like uh, fundraising and development, you're probably going to find a number of the same charts that you see here. One, two, three, and four is identification, cultivation, solicitation, and stewardship. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's something that's been with us for all of our lives. But at the same time, nope, I'm not, I'm not uh, getting it to go forward, Greg. 
Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, folks. We'll, we'll get this sorted out. If you, the next slide just came up. Is that correct, Don? That's the, I just have that standard model for development gift process. Mm -hmm. There we go. But that, that has too much on it. Okay. Yeah, there, yeah. Okay, so I, I, I like to start off with a reference to a book that was really formative in my life. Back in 1988, Roger, Robert Fulgham came out with his New York Times bestseller called All I Really Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. You can read the things that he put down there on the slide, but that's the, not the relative part. The thin, nice thing about that book was is that it told us from an early age what we needed to know in order to have a good life. You had to care for others, you had to, you had to clean up, you had to live a balanced life, you took a nap every afternoon. All of these were really good ideas at the time. And it was a very popular book. And, and although it was, some people thought it was very simple-minded, a lot of people learned a lot from it. I, I was a real devotee of this book, so I decided to try to come up with a system in our profession that would be the same kind of thing that we have here. Uh, next slide. I, I wish I had the control. That, that incidentally is the, the picture of my own kindergarten class. You'll notice the little type that's sitting on the teacher's map. That's me, I learned early in life, you have to get along with your teachers. Okay, next slide. All I need to know about development, I learned five random quotes, just like Robert Fulgham uh, told us about how to live a good life. I've come up with five random quotes that came from people at different phases in my life, which really led me to the, the model that we're going to be talking about this morning. So let's go to the next slide. The first slide comes from my high school English teacher in 1958, Evelyn Kaufman's. Show her picture there, Greg. This is Mrs. Kaufman. Looked like a lot of high school English teachers back in that time. The best teacher I've ever had was Mrs. Kaufman because she taught us all things about English. She talked to us about, uh, about great literature, Shakespeare. We did plays, we did all these things. But in one way or another, every class we had, she would stress to us that your words will define who you are to others and to yourself. So choose your words carefully. And that made a deep impression on me. And when I got back to, uh, to, to, to working in the development and fundraising field, next slide. I came upon this chart, which I've already chosen once. And to me, it didn't have a lot of soul and it didn't have a lot of, of, of spirit to it. It's just a bunch of words that to the ordinary person on the street, they're kind of stuffy words, you know, identification, cultivation, solicitation, and stewardship. Okay, uh, next slide. The one I like best is this is the word solicitation. I went on to Google uh, images to find out what the world is most likely to see in the when it's uh, connected to the word solicit or solicitation. And you'll find if you do that, and I recommend that you do, that almost every word that's connected with solicitation and soliciting is a negative word in the normal population. Now we in the development world know what it means. It means we're going to go and ask people for help for our organizations. But I, I put this slide up because when you're out amongst people, I'd, I'd suggest that you don't necessarily lose use that word because as soon as you mention it, people are going to have a negative impression because of the, all the different ways they see the negative word connected with soliciting. Okay, next slide. My second quote comes from Maya Angelou. I went to a education conference about 40 years ago to listen to Maya Angelou, and, and she gave a spectacular talk, which we all thought we would. Back in those days, I was in the field of education, so I wanted to know what she had to say. And what stuck with me was a quote that she made early on in her program, and put that up there, Greg, Greg that you want to compose a good world as educators. It is an honorable and noble profession. 
So what I would urge and what I do urge with all of the training I do in fundraising and development is to remind people that that's exactly what we are doing in the nonprofit sector. We want to help compose a good world, regardless of what our, what our missions are, everything, whether it's from human rights, animal rights, climate, climate change, anything you put on it, we are all in the, proce in the process of composing as good a world as we can. So never let it leave your mind that you are working in an honorable and a noble profession. How much you may get depressed sometime because you don't always get yeses, but un re remind yourself about Maya Angelou that what you are doing is honorable and it's a noble profession. All right, next slide. That brings us back to this. The, none of these really say much to us. So I've, I've decided that we, we can do the same kind of chart with different words that are a little more meaningful. Next slide. Successful development to me is really a mystical mingling of three ingredients. You have to have a joyful giver, that's one soul. You have to have an artful asker, in many cases, that's you. And you have to have a grateful recipient, that is the individual or the worker in your organization that is receiving the gift that has been given. So rather than just saying that we, we, we're going to go out and ask people for money, understand that if it's done right, this will be a mystical mingling of a joyful giver, an artful asker, and a grateful recipient. Well, how are we going to put this in some kind of a what kind of framework? Next slide. First of all, we have to create a joyful giver. In creating a joyful giver, the first thing we have to do is identify who it is we want to talk with. That's the next slide, Greg. And um, yeah, that, 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 I, I didn't get all of that last slide, but this is okay. That would bring, uh, no, we, we've got, can we go back? There's more to that last slide. Don, unfortunately, I'm just having this, I'm sorry. Okay. <clears throat> It's really important that we get the first the first part of this. I'm sorry, folks. We're uh, we're this is the first session, so it got us a little bit of slack anyway. Don, and I, I do apologize. I'm not seeing the second piece of the slide. I oh. Okay. Well, <clears throat> then I, what what I'll do is I'll just sort of explain what happens. Down in the lower left-hand corner of this slide, you will see that we have to, first of all, identify who it is we might want to go and talk with because we feel that they may have an interest in our organization. And then we have an arrow pointing straight up next to creating the joyful giver, which says that we have to go out and meet them. We have to go out and make a connection and when we make a connection and finally get the point where we get a chance to meet somebody, then we are in the process of creating the joyful giver. And the, now, the, now the next slide, which would bring us to, to quote number three. John Mordridge is a retired CEO and chairman of Cisco Systems. Um, he's been extremely successful in his business world. He and his wife, Tasha, who is an educator, uh, are the largest donors ever to the uh, still still and ever to the University of Wisconsin. And let me tell you the story that I have for them. Uh, I was the privileged one to first meet with them when I first came into the business when John was a, a, in, a, in a different kind of a company. And I was going out to San Francisco to, to meet, a, meet a number of folks. And I called John and he answered the phone and I said, I'm coming out to San Francisco. I'm representing the School of Business at the University of Wisconsin. I'd love to get to know you better. And he said, well, let's have breakfast. I said, fine. So we met for breakfast and he was 15 minutes late, which I assume made me have the wrong day or something. When he finally came in, he sat down and he said, Don, I don't have much time. So tell me what you have to tell me. And I say, well, John, you know that the business school, you've read it in our, in our publications, is trying to raise enough fun, private funds to match with the state funding to build a new school, a new business school building. 
And John said, well, how much is it that you need? And I said, well, our goal is to raise $8 million, which in today's dollars is about $15 million. And John said, without, without flinching, well, I can't give you the whole thing, but I will give you $1 million to get you started. That happened only once in my career that you could close a major gift in one meeting, but John is quite a different kind of a person. Since then, John and Tasha have, have, have given increasing amounts of money to various projects at the University of Wisconsin. They built a new English building, a, 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 a big new education building, rather, a new technical center on campus. They, they, they supported some students at the two-year colleges throughout the UW system. And their total giving now to the University of Wisconsin has been over $500 million, half a billion dollars, which is about two and a half million dollars in today's, uh, 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 80 some million dollars in today's dollars. So uh, when I, I got to know John, uh, when he would come into Madison, I would sort of be his chauffeur. And I picked him up after, going, after he had just come back from a talk at another large campus. And he told me that he was a very bad experience. I said, well, how was it? Because it's a wonderful university. He said, well, they, they took me in a limousine. I'd never been on campus before. And we went to the president's house and they had a little reception with all the big wigs on, on campus. And then the president took me into his office and asked me for a gift of $8 million for a new basketball stadium. And he said, I was so offended that I almost walked out and, and refused to give my, my technology speech to the, to the, to the department of of uh, computer sciences. He did the talk anyway, but he went away feeling very negative about that because he said, what you and your colleagues need to know in the fundraising and development business is that, and that's the next, the, the next tick, uh, Greg, you must earn the right to ask. And that's really important to remember, a very important thing. You can't just go out and ask people for money you must do it right. In other words, you must do your work in earning the right to ask. Okay, the next slide. There are five reasons people give major and ultimate gifts. Number one, they share your organizations and your beliefs, values, and dreams. If I'm the giver, I give because it is a good thing to do. The mortgages always thought it was one of the best things they could do with their money. Giving is good that people give it. You do not have to apologize because you're giving them an opportunity to feel good. They want to have an impact on some important project that you're involved with. They have to like that impact and, and, and do what you need to do to make that impact happen. And never underestimate the fact that the people you're working with not only has to be have to be very close to your organization as you move on, but you've got to do everything in your power to have them like you. That's very important. Their affection for you, they're looking forward to seeing you rather than saying, oh gosh, here he comes again. You have to make yourself not deep friendly friends with them, but a highly respected person representing the organization that you're working with. And one of the major reasons people give uh, large and ultimate gifts, which are really large, large, large gifts, like the mortgages have done, is that it makes them feel good about what they have done. Now, you can read books and books and books, but I will guarantee you that these are the five main reasons that people give major and ultimate gifts. Okay, next slide. So we've created the joyful giver. Now, once we've created a joyful giver, let's go to the next slide. Oh, there we go. Now we've got the identification. Next, next click. Now we're going to get the uh, connection. That's the first meetings. The, and then creating the joyful giver. Now, oops, here we go. Let's see what you. Oh, now we come to uh, Carol Bartz. When we get together with somebody, and we missed another couple of those clicks, Jen, uh, Greg, that will come back on the next slide. We have to work with the person after we've met with them the first time you very seldom will get the major gift you ask for on the first meeting. You probably not ought, ought, ought not to even do that. But it'll normally take some time between six months and two years 
to create the kind of relationship that will result in one of these very large gifts for your organization. And by my large gift, understand that I worked with a major institution, so we could talk as we like to do in the millions and tens of millions of dollars. If you're in a small organization where a large gift for you is $100, that's every bit as important as the big organizations are for their 1 million. I know that's true because I work with a lot of very small organizations as well. They can be equally successful. But anyway, <clears throat> once, we, once we do the work, these oftentimes six months to two years of work, sometimes it's longer than that, then we have to make the ask. Now, that brings me to quote number four, which is Carol Bart. You can tell by her, by her smile and her attitude that she's a really, really nice person. She's a retired CEO at Yahoo. And I went out to talk with her one time when we had a chancellor that had a top list of what she really needed before the university. And my goal, my, my mandate from the chancellor was, that's our president, the chancellor had a list of things for me to bring up with everybody that I met who was likely to give a major gift. So I started to go through that list with Carol and I got about down to the number five one and she said, Don, you're boring me to death. She said, you don't understand that I don't really care what your needs are. Show me how I can make an impact in an area that I actually care about. So when you go out and meet with people, try to find that connection with the person that you're dealing with, that you're working with, try to find that connection to some part of what you do to make an impact in what they actually care about. I'm also very much active in a, in, in a, in a program to, to run a, a, a children's village program in the country of Malawi, Africa, where my wife and I were Peace Corps volunteers back before any of you were born probably in 1965 and 1966. And that is an organization entirely different from the University of Wisconsin, because a good year for that organization is to get in enough money to keep people alive for yet another week. And so I, I, I know that for some organizations, a major gift might be up in that million dollar range. But for many of you, that's not the case. You might be thrilled to get a thousand dollar gift. We are thrilled when we get a thousand dollar gift for the Malawi Children's Village, because that will have an effect of re re releasing starvation from about a hundred people for three months. So you don't, they don't care about what your needs are. Show them how they can make an impact in an area they actually care about. Okay, next slide. Okay, critical realities of, 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 of raising funds. Number one reality is that people and organizations seldom give to you because you need the money. We've already talked about that. Reality two is the, pardon me, people will give at a lower level because they want what, because of what you do. They give to the what. But if you want to get large gifts, you've got to convince people that why you do it is the most important thing of all. People give at the upper levels because of why you do it. So concentrate on why you do it with your values, your beliefs, and your dreams. I'll tell you another story. I worked with a historical organization uh, who was just starting what they call and what we all call a capital campaign. Okay. And I was meeting with board members and executives of the program and some top volunteers. And they were struggling about how they were going to write their 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 best possible uh, uh, case statement. We all know what that is. Not many people know what a case statement is unless they work in this business, but I never liked that con con conflict anyway. A case statement to me is a very clear explanation of your values, your beliefs, and dreams. So we divided that group of about 20 people into five different groups of four, and I gave them a very simple 10-minute 10, 10 project to write their own case statement, their own opening of the case statement, where every word in that opening statement will begin with our values, our beliefs, or our dreams. I gave them the 10 minutes, then I asked for some, some people, and I thought I wouldn't get any responses, but all of a sudden, nearly every group in the room held up their hands. They were really excited. 
Remember, this is a historical society in Wisconsin. And the first one just blew me away because it was the best case statement I've ever read. And I've read those that have gone on for 5,000 words. This was less than 100 words. And it went something like this. We believe that every citizen in Wisconsin has the right to know his history, his or her history. We value that we are the kind of organization that can satisfy this need for people. And we know that people have dreams about what we can do in the future because of what our history is in the past. That's what people like. And I told them that that was probably the best case statement I've ever read. And I've read a billion of them. You probably have too. But in your case statement, for example, make sure you let people know what you actually value, believe, and dreams. People and organizations give because they share these values with your organization. Okay, next, next slide. <clears throat> so now we're down to making the artful ask. And when we make the artful ask, we've got to be very careful about how we do it. Uh, next slide, I think, will be our next, our next quote. Making an artful ask goes something like this. This is a good, good template for you. And the, you will have, uh, Mary Beth, they will have these slides, won't they? Yes, thank you for yeah. asking, Don. I did want to make a quick administrative note about that. If you look at the workbook materials that include the background materials, they were sent by Jessica prior <laughs> to today's session. There is a link to slides in there. I will tell you that I had to update that at the beginning of the session because the link was faulty, but now the link in that workbook goes to this slide deck. So if you need to refresh okay. your workbook, you do have access to these slides. Thank you. Okay, Dad. great, great. Uh, I, I was very concerned about that because uh, when, when I do programs, I, in, I, I, I usually try to have every people make certain slides and make put them in some kind of a, 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 a frame and put them on their desk and refer to them every time. And this is one of them. When you're making an artful ask, this is how it's done. People always say, well, how on earth do you ask for money? It's not that hard. First of all, you recognize what they have already done. This makes them feel good, makes them feel comfortable, and they don't mind that you're going on. Then show your organizational pride through you, through your posture, through your own enthusiasm, and through your passion for the work that your organization is due. Restate your why. What are your values, beliefs, and dreams? And be considerate. Don't ask for money. Ask for, for consideration of a gift of a specific amount if the project is clear. If not, rely on your instincts and intuition. You're not going to offend them if you've done those first four steps carefully. And then state the specific project and what its impact will be on the society that these people are most important on. And then once you've made that ask and you practice this with colleagues of yours, it's a lot of fun. Then please, please just be quiet. After you've made this kind of an ask, the next person to speak must be the potential giver. And this is especially important if you go with a volunteer, you need to make sure that they do that too. Because oftentimes a volunteer will go and feel, feel embarrassed that they're asking other people for money because they haven't had an opportunity to have seminars like, like you're having for the next several uh, weeks and months here. Uh, they, they don't have that. And I, I've seen it happen where the, the ask is very good, but the other person there will say, oh, or, or whatever you can, you can afford. That's not the right thing to say. Always make sure that the next person to speak after you made the ask is the potential giver. Just sit back in your chair, smile comfortably, and wait for them to respond. Okay, next slide. Once you've made the ask, you will get one of three different responses. Number one, click. I'll just say click. They might say no. In all my years of working with the University of Wisconsin, my, my 33 years with the University of Wisconsin, I very seldom had an absolute no. And in most cases, that was because it was from an experience they have with the university in the past. 
I once went to a, a former baseball star who was a multi-million dollar uh, potential giver now. And after I had introduced myself, he said, I'll tell you what, if you're here to ask me for money, there's only one way I will do that. He said, 20 years ago, Wisconsin quit having a baseball team because they said it was too cold in Wisconsin. He said, until you reinstate the baseball program, I'm not giving you a cent. So that was a no. <laughs> and then we went on from there. So, but normally what's going to happen, you'll get one of two. Oftentimes you will get this, this in the next click, you will get a maybe. <clears throat> one click. And the maybe is the timing is not quite right for me. I'm not sure about the amount that you've suggested, but let me give us some thought and we'll let you know. And then you have to then you have to arrange for another appointment or the timing of it. They may have all kinds of concerns. I have two kids at Harvard and one at Yale, for example, and my, I'm a little stressed right now, but let's keep in touch because I am interested in what you're doing. But if you do it right, normally in between one out of three or one out of five times and you've done everything right, you are likely to get a yes. That's a click. <clears throat> and now that'll bring us to the final quote. Next click. And this quote comes from one of my favorite people, Jim Calloway, a former Texas oil executive. And I wasn't even representing the uh, <clears throat> the uh, University of Wisconsin here, I was doing a program for the community college system in the mountains of Colorado. Jim and his wife, who is an arts advocate, moved to from Texas to, to Colorado because Jim wanted to have a farm where he could have lots of animals. He loved animals. His wife wanted to be in a place that had lots of arts. And of course, that's, the, uh, that, that, that's sort of that wonderful area in the mountains where you have all those nice art museums and everything. So they moved out there and they got involved with this community college because the community college got to know them and put, them on, put Jim on the board and all that kind of stuff. And then I was riding around Jim's farm one time with him in his tractor and he was going around from place to place uh, showing me his animals. He named them all, talked to all of them. And he was just a really sweet guy with his animals, but he could be tough as nails otherwise. And 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 I, I during that during that kind of tour of his farm, I said, "Well, well, Jim, how do you feel about what you've done?" Because Jim had already given a million dollars to this program for obviously their veterinary school, and his wife had given a million dollars because he did. To, the, to establish a new art center so that student art could be displayed on campus. And Jim says, well, I couldn't be happier. He had this, this thick Texas accent. He said, I'm having so much fun with, with the dogs and the cats and the horses. Every time I go up to the, to the school, they take me on a tour. I can talk to the animals. They thank me for all that I've done. And I couldn't feel much better about that. I said, how does your wife feel about the, the gift she made? Well, she's really disappointed because they took that money. And yeah, they had a small art gallery, but the rest of the building that she bought, that, that she bought for them uh, has nothing but administrative offices. And that's not what she wanted. So she's not very happy. And then he said, you know, Don, if, if, I, were, if I were you, I would, I would remember this. And this is the quote, next click. The giver has the right to enjoy the given. And when he said that, it struck me as being one of the real truisms in this profession. Once a giver has made a gift, they have a right to enjoy what they've done. And your task is to make sure that they have that enjoyment. And next, next slide. And the neat thing, the neat thing about that is that you show enough gratitude, then you're going, next slide. There's a, cre a critical three-legged stool of how you show gratitude, guaranteeing that the giver will enjoy the giving. I put that stool up there to show the showing gratitude is supported by a three-pronged uh, 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 chair. 
First of all is stewardship, a very good word. But what a stewardship means, it means you let them know how the money has been spent. That's what stewardship is. You let them know how the money has been sent, spent, especially how the, how the, the gift has, wor has worked for your organization. You have to explain to them the impact that the gift has made. And you find as many creative ways of saying thank you as you can. And believe me, an annual letter saying, we so appreciate your, your gift. Now, why don't you give us a little more next year? That doesn't work. Find a way to surprise them. And I'll just tell you a, a, a one story <clears throat> about uh, how you can really be good. And then I'll give another some, coming from an example. We had a wonderful man who's now deceased who was a, a star basketball player at Wisconsin. And he gave the basketball program uh, about a million dollars, gave the School of Business about five million dollars. And he gave us a program for students from the two-year colleges who had grades enough to get into Madison but could not afford, he would pay for their tuition. So he did, did, did those three things, basketball, students, and, 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 and what was the other, the other one, basketball and business school because he's a business school grad. So I got together with a group of people to find out how we could really do something for him that would make him enjoy what he gave. And so what we did is that we scheduled a, a party for him, a very small party, not, not expensive. We had another person that sponsored the party and we invited him and his wife to the party. And, and, and we didn't tell him it was gonna be a kind of thank you party. We just wanted, and he was a real basketball fan. So what we did is we invited all of the students who were on campus at the time, who were benefiting from his, from, from his scholarships. We gave him a signed basketball by all of those students. And we gave him kind of a special gift from the business school. He was so joyful that he ended up giving a lot of more money to every one of those organizations. He said he'd never been thanked as well. And so that, that's the kind of thing you have to keep in mind. Don't just do the same old things all the time. Have fun with it. Have fun with it so that your givers can have fun with what they have done. Okay, next, next slide. You must show that you are managing the gift money well. That's the stewardship. And that the gift dollars are going for the purpose intended. Click. You must show the impact of a gift. Show them what it's done. And finally, you must be creative in saying thank you, doing it better than anyone else. Try to thank yourself for coming up with an idea that was better than anything else. It doesn't have to be a big party. I could, I could sit here for another half hour and tell you some stories about how I have been thanked for some of the gifts I, that I have made. And in every case, it increased the giving I was giving to that organization by a significant amount. Okay, next slide. So finally, once we have shown how grateful we are, then click. It's not over with because if you show enough creativity, you will not leave that person in the dark. You will keep working with them because if you show enough creativity, then click. <clears throat> you are likely to find additional interest and the cycle will start all over again. And you can go round and around and around in that cycle. And almost every time, the dollars that you receive will be greater than the dollars that they gave the time before. So, all right, next slide. <clears throat> I finished the talk by showing this. Here, I've, uh, the, that, that kind of stulted but popular graph on the right side of the slide shows a person who has a posture that has been following that Wait, professional, nice looking, probably very good at what he does, but, but he wasn't too thrilled by making the gift. He said, okay, I'll do something for you. But on the other side, if you concentrate on the mystical mingling of a joyful giver and artful asker and a grateful recipient, you will create real joy in people for what they have done. Next slide. 
So what I want you to remember mostly, not only that joyful giving, artful asker and grateful recipient, but these five quotes, and I, I urge you to, to get them into your memory bank and, and, and post them on your bulletin board or whatever. Number one, you want to compose a good world. It's an honorable and noble profession. Number two, your words define who you are to others and to yourself. Choose them carefully. Number three, you must earn the right to ask. Number four, I don't care what your needs are. Show me how I can make an impact in an area I actually care about. And then good old Jim, the giver has the right to enjoy the giving. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> so I leave you with this cycle of, psych of successful development. I urge you to take it seriously. <clears throat> A lot of people find this talk to be kind of simple-minded. Believe me, it is not. It's the, it's the ability to, to make connections with people to help your organization get to where they want to go. Okay, I may have taken a few extra minutes, Mary Beth, and I apologize for that. But thank you very, very much, uh, all of you for attending. I've enjoyed this a lot, so thank you very much. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the, the, the programs as much as I will. Okay, back Don, to you, Mary Beth. Don, thank you so much for sharing <laughs> that. What I love most about it, and this is anyone who's known me, is I'm all about relationships. So genuine and authentic relationships and the words mystical and joy coming in with that. Uh, I loved it so much. Uh, well, thank you again, Don, for all that. And now, Mary Beth, you are next. Yes, thank you. I want to echo um, Greg's thanks and appreciation for Don's talk. Um, Don clearly has quite a track record securing major gifts and doing it in a very relational way and being able to boil that down for us. And I think for many of us that approach fundraising, that kind of major gift development is perhaps the most intimidating part of this full adventure of doing revenue models development and, and, and resources development. And so hearing from someone that has that experience that has taught so many people about it is just so valuable. Um, and I think that it's just true that no matter what revenue model you put together for your organization, there is going to be a need for you to look at major gifts. And those tips on major gifts specifically are things that we should all learn and get comfortable with. And now uh, we're excited because we get to pivot a little bit towards some other themes that are going to come up in this webinar series. Um, if you could just go back one more, Greg. I am trying to, sorry. No problem. I will just mention while you're doing that, um, oops, going, wanting to go the other direction. Um, just wanted to, yeah, let's, stay on, let's stay on this one for a moment. I just want to remind everybody while I have the floor as well, um, that we do have a worksheet that you should have received in your email from Jessica. Throughout the webinar series, the worksheet is going to give you a chance to take down your notes and also to access some extensive background materials that we're going to provide you. So, for example, with this session, we're going to go over some pretty um, broad sweeping themes that will be dug into more throughout the webinar series. But if you want to start going a little deeper on those themes after hearing from me and Tony today about the bullet points, you can refer to the background materials in your worksheet. Um, and so I just want to make sure everybody's aware of that. The slide deck is also linked in that document. If you have questions about where to access that, feel free to mention it in the chat. And I encourage folks as we're going through this content to take down your notes about questions you might have, because not only are we going to hear from Michael Johnson, an exemplar in implementing some of the things that Don and me and Tony are going to talk about today, and you're, you might have questions for him about implementation. We're also going to bring Don back and have an opportunity for Q&A in the group at the end of today's session. So um, just a few housekeeping notes there. So with, with that, I'm going to move forward now. Um, I already introduced myself at the beginning of the session, so I'm going to turn over the mic to Tony Shields, my collaborator on this presentation, to just say a few words about himself and his organization. Thank you, Mary Beth, uh, for the opportunity to participate in today's conversation. And thank you, Don, for uh, the insights that you provided as, as kind of a kickoff for this. Um, your, your presentation was so relational. And, you know, I think that that, you know, is a, is a key tenant in the approaches that we need to have in not only in fundraising, 
but in community development, in philanthropy, in all the spaces that we're in is being relational and uh, working with people in, in very collaborative ways. So, so thank you for shining a, a light on that, Don, with your comments today. Um, my name is Tony Shields. I'm president and CEO of Wisconsin Philanthropy Network. Uh, WPN is a membership organization of grant makers throughout the state of Wisconsin. Um, we are comprised of uh, community foundations, corporate foundations, family foundations, uh, health-related funders, and education funders uh, throughout the state of Wisconsin. And then uh, several other partners that are working in the spaces of, um, of uh, community improvements all over the state. The goal of our organization is to promote effective philanthropy within the state of Wisconsin. Um, and we work with our 130 member organizations and about 700 to 750 professionals in the nonprofit sector. And really what we wanna do is we wanna build up the sector. Our job as an organization is to share national best practices, bring them into local focus, um, find state approaches that are similar and best practices to share among our members. Um, we convene around key and important issues that are happening in our communities. Uh, and really we act as a convener, a fire starter in some cases, uh, uh, we also delve into detail. Uh, we have a, a, a statewide conference that we produce for our members, as well as the Wisconsin Gibbs report that will be coming out later this year. We will share that with Mary Beth and Commons, and they can disseminate that to all of the nonprofit organizations that they also work with. So um, <clears throat> I have a lot of fun in my work. Uh, uh, I recognize it appeals back the curtain of philanthropy to be able to work with the actual people that I know many of you are in the chase on trying to connect with and build relationships with. Uh, I do have experience in corporate philanthropy as well as the nonprofit sector. So I, I feel your pain, I appreciate your work and I appreciate what you all do to enhance uh, the communities and the people that you serve throughout your work. Beautiful, thanks Tony. It's always good, Tony and I have some good experience collaborating on some of this stuff and we're going to have a pretty informal back and forth as we go over the content of these slides so greg um next one please so i'll just i'll just buzz through our goals and framing for this 30 minute session that we're now in as a subset of this overall first kickoff session of the webinar series we really want to present to you here in follow-up to don's talk some new waves and trends to consider that we see coming down the pipeline from our respective vantage points at a university center looking at the nonprofit sector and Tony being in national and statewide conversations from the funder side on what are some things coming down the pipeline that we think should probably come into play in your big picture strategies and day to day tactics. It is important to be paying attention to trends to be able to stay effective. And we also believe there's even a possibility that those of you working in frontlines organizations can help nudge the sector in certain directions, in conversations with funders, in your own strategies to help make the case for even better giving. And I think that as we get into the topic today, you'll see what we mean by that. The perspectives we're drawing from here are the national and global commentary that we get a little bit of bandwidth to pay attention to in our respective roles. Tony is going to specifically bring some insights from what he's hearing from funders across the state of Wisconsin, but he's also connected to national giving organizations like his um, in the rest of the country. So he's got some insights as to beyond Wisconsin as well. And then we both get from our own personal professional experience before we were in these roles, but also in our day to day work, a lot of input from practitioners and frontline organizations that we're working with such as Michael Johnson here today, who is on the front lines of fundraising for a really important local organization here in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, and we um, constantly in presenting these kinds of talks hear from all of you. So, you know, not only can we bring that in from our past occasions to do this sort of thing, but we hope we'll hear from you today about your insights as well. So we want to give you an overview of the trends that we're seeing. And um, in the future of this webinar series, you're gonna see that each of the sessions that we've got planned going forward kind of break down these individual trends and take a deeper dive on each of them. <clears throat> Go ahead, next slide, Greg. 
Okay, so one thing you might have heard a lot about, I feel like it's hitting the mainstream buzz quite a bit, is that there is a generational shift happening in the wealth of the world and the giving that we expect to see happening based on a generational transfer of wealth. Um, even before this kind of idea that the baby boomers who have been holding a lot of the wealth, uh, that their wealth would actually physically, tangibly transfer to the next generation, um, about which there's still a lot of unknowns. In the meantime, we know that there's different issues, themes, and approaches that are emerging as the millennials and the Gen Zs sort of have a bigger voice in looking at issues of mission-based work. Um, and so it's important for us to think about what are some new ideas and changes that might be coming with a generational shift like this. Um, we see that a lot of family foundations and wealth holding individuals are of that baby boomer class or were founded, the family foundations and funds that exist now were founded in, in many cases by baby boomer gen or before. Uh, but there's also very pressing critiques that are hitting the sort of intellectual landscape and um, the, the zeitgeist about whether the way that those baby boomer and previous family foundations and funders and wealth holders have been doing their business, whether or not that is the way that it really should be done. Um, our center is hosting a book club this summer where we're spending the whole summer on upwards of 20 books that have come out in the last 20 years that really dig in on what kinds of things haven't really gone so well in the last generations of um, high wealth um, holding individuals and families and their approaches to fundraising. Um, and then I think that Tony can probably talk about this a little bit more, but we we see some changes with corporate giving um, as corporations have changes in leadership generationally, that's gonna also affect the way that they do their thing. So um, I'm gonna pause there and just see if Tony wants to add anything to these kind of key concepts that I've tried to lay out. And then we can talk a little bit about those examples. Yeah, so, um, you know, it's interesting when I, when I, when I look at this slide, um, what, what I think it really illustrates for me is that um, I would describe it as, I would describe this, this slide as an example of the fluidity that's happening in philanthropy. Um, I think there have been many uh, misconceptions about what philanthropy is from a generational perspective what a lot of people outside of the philanthropic organizations believe that philanthropy is all about, that it is, uh, that it does kind of live in the space of, of uh, boomers. Um, and there is transition, there is fluidity and transition that is happening um, in the spaces of philanthropy. Philanthropy is uh, becoming more intentional. It's becoming more strategic and it's also getting better at uh, being more narrative, actually telling the stories of who they fund and why they fund them. Um, there's always been this little game that's been happening in communities around philanthropy where uh, the philanthropist only shows themselves in these controlled situations where they, where they, where they don't necessarily wanna feel like they are out and vulnerable. And what I'm seeing in, from a philanthropic perspective is that grant makers are now beginning the processes of being out and about, wanting to understand what's happening in communities, having key questions that are being asked, and then assessing all of that in the decision-making uh, that they are making in the grant making that they're doing. As it relates to different issues and themes and approaches, um, I think there are a couple of slides that will talk about equity, trust-based philanthropy, but also nonprofit capacity building. There are more conversations about supporting operation, operational support, unrestricted operational support within those spaces. And that's an important component and a thing that's happening new beyond project-based work that's happening. As it relates to family foundation, uh, there's a lot of conversations about minimizing the power dynamic between grant maker and grantee. Um, a lot of really good conversations that are happening. And yes, in the corporate giving spaces, I think the biggest change in the corporate giving space is that uh, there's just uh, a fluidity in the people that are leading that work in the corporate setting. Corporate settings have a lot of job shifting. They have a lot of movement. 
And so the person they, that might be running philanthropy for a, for a corporation, a for-profit entity today may not be in that seat in the next couple of years. And so there's a, a desire for learning, learning quickly, uh, benchmarking uh, effective work that's happening from other co-corporate organizations. And I really do think that that is an opportunity for those nonprofit organizations that are out there to be able to retell their story and not necessarily get caught up in things like, oh, XYZ company didn't fund me two years ago, they won't fund me today. That there is a lot of good fluidity that's happening in the corporate giving uh, strategies that are out there. Yeah, beautiful insights and, and follow up there, Tony. Um, so just to get into the examples and details over there, I mean, you see the numbers there. There's an estimation that by 2030, an estimated $15.4 trillion of assets will have been passed down to a new generation by the world's richest people. So that's not so far off right now. Um, and it's, if you're thinking about the long term of your organization, that might be something worth thinking about across the family foundations, across the individuals, across the corporate leadership, like Tony's referring to. And I think we already see the possibility, much as Tony referred to, and we'll get into more in this talk, uh, that new generations of those holding the you know, controls on some of that wealth are going to have different philosophies and thinking about what's going on in the world and how philanthropic giving should play into it. I think we all already see the way that next generations are interested in things like social innovation, looking at root, root causes, looking at social entrepreneurship, looking at equity, looking at even as this New York Times article that is referred to there, giving away more than the required amount of a family foundation. You see people saying things like, if climate change is gonna take us down in the next 50 years, why would we hold on to a corpus in a foundation so that we can keep giving out 5% every year until kingdom come when we might not have an earth to live on anymore. And so you see people kind of saying some radical things that I don't think we've seen fully flourish, but there are um, new gen thinkers that are going to be taking the reins on some of this wealth. And I think that's just a, a, an important theme to keep in mind in general. Um, technology also plays into it. And we're gonna talk about that specifically today. Next slide. Oops, back one, I think. Yeah. So, I mean, I think one back. Okay. Got Sorry. A, there we go. That, yeah, okay. Got a touchy control there. I, I've been in that seat. Um, so, I mean, it's 2022. Uh, we've all been long overdue in all of our lifetimes in addressing the need to make philanthropy and our world uh more open to diversity equity inclusion access looking at the historic devastating realities of the isms that have affected us colonialism racism sexism ableism all the stuff but it's 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 just true that in the last two years especially in this sector we've seen folks taking a harder look at the way that the nonprofit sector itself is is has very problematic trends in history in this arena. And it is time for all givers and frontline organizations to be taking action uh, on these issues and these inequities. Um, so recognition of historic oppression and, and making statements about this, yes, but not being performative about it and actually implementing action that gets at historic oppression and exclusion um, is, is of just, paramount importance to every organization trying to fundraise. The reality is that funders are going to ask you about it. So you've got to find ways to talk about the way that your organization is addressing um, inequities in your community, within the internal operations of your organization, and the way that your mission relates to social justice in these ways. That's my observation. Not all grant makers are as concerned yeah. with it as others, but I think it's true, and Tony, I'll, I'll invite you to chime in here, uh, uh, that it, it is time for any organization trying to fundraise with foundations and funders to know at least how they're going to speak to this issue. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I, I would say it's important to learn and understand how you're going to speak to this issue. I would also implore you to think about how you're speaking about the issue in very authentic and honest ways, um, that you're not approaching it 
like you're checking a box to be able to answer the question. But I do recognize, and I do want to call this out, that um, when Mary Beth said that you will be asked about kind of your equity focus and, and where that work is, I slightly cringe because I recognize that um, from, a, from a philanthropy side, that philanthropy has a long way to go in their equity work, that for them in some cases to be asking the question um, is a little bit of a misnomer when you think about the fact that they also have work to do also. Uh, the good news is, is that there has been a deeper focus, I think, from many Wisconsin grant makers in looking at themselves and their own equitable practices and their own equitable work. They're tying a lot of it into their trust-based philanthropy approaches. They are doing good work at understanding the complexities around equity issues that are happening in communities. They are rethinking about their grant making philosophies as it relates to um, grant making. They're also, there's also a push for more representation within organizations around people of color and others coming in um, to uh, work at the foundations and be representative. And there, there is also a desire, I think, and really good work that's happening around community-centered approaches in decision-making that philanthropy is recognizing that they do need to become more community-centered, um, that the community should be in a lot of cases helping to drive the decisions that are made around grant making. So those are all great things that are happening. I think the other thing that, um, that we are looking at in terms of the work that we're doing with um, many of our members as it relates to equity is that we're recognizing that the equity journey is very different from organization to organization and from person to person. That we are thinking about the fact that when members of ours come to a table, regarding a conversation about equity, they are coming from all over the place. They are running the gamut. There are some that are self-described experts. There are others that have not begun the work and are now afraid to start the work because they think they're so far behind. And so a lot of the work that we're doing is to uh, promote and celebrate the journey that organizations are on wherever they're on those their journeys. And then the other thing that I would be remiss if I didn't bring up in the example section, you're gonna see liberatory consciousness. Uh, Wisconsin Philanthropy Network has embraced liberatory consciousness as a foundation for our equity work that we are doing. And liberatory consciousness looks at four things. It looks at awareness around the issue of equity. It looks at analysis. It looks at action and it looks at allyship. And when you talk about the journey that any organization is on, even your organization, um, you, are, you are likely to fall into one of these four categories in your own place and your own work right now. And our goal is to move to more, less action, I'm sorry, less awareness and move more into action within the work that we are doing. But liberatory consciousness, um, uh, Barbara Love is the uh, expert on that in that area. Uh, I would I would encourage you all to look further into that as a uh, as a as a good grounding for good equity work in not only your organization but understanding that a lot of uh, phil philanthropic organizations are thinking about that. Right. So although it's a broad range of where frontlines organizations and funders are at with this issue. I think that it's an important one for everyone to include in their in their planning. And our next session, in fact, is going to take a deeper dive on this. Um, and I think it's just also important as a big takeaway to recognize that it is a journey. Um, this idea that you're going to go from zero to fully implemented in your hopes and dreams for how to be an inclusive or anti-racist organization that it, it isn't gonna happen overnight. And um, this idea of um, understanding where you are on your journey um, and, and knowing that it needs to go beyond performative um, because it's the right thing to do and because there's more focus on it um, is, is really important in any revenue model and fundraising plan. So next slide. So another concept we're gonna to get to deep dive on in this series is what we call trust-based philanthropy. And I'm not sure how much this is hitting the mainstream as a household word, but for folks like me and Tony that are looking at the big picture of 
the sector, it's become very, very common to be in discussions that refer to this, this, this concept. Um, the key components of what constitutes trust-based philanthropy are listed here. Um, it's a lot about redistribution of power from the funders holding most of the power to recognizing that those on the front lines and doing the work and in community have knowledge um, and should be given more power around how to get the work done. So I'm gonna give everybody a minute to just look at those key components there, knowing that we are gonna have a full session on this topic. But I'll also ask while you're doing that, um, if Tony wants to just say anything about how this is being folded into the funder side of things. Yeah, so we are having a lot of conversations on our end on our side around trust-based philanthropy and trust-based approaches. We uh, began these conversations in 2019. Um, they have begun to take shape uh, and we are working at, at making these conversations more organic in our work. If you talk to any funder, you, you grab any grant maker, funder, person on the street who's dispensing their dollars and dispensing their work uh, into communities, into nonprofit organizations, they're likely to tell you that they're doing one or two or three or four of these things already. Uh, what trust? What the trust-based philanthropy project does is it brings all is is it brings all of these areas, all six of these areas, into more curriculum-based conversation within the work. Um, I think that there have been a lot of really good conversations there. You'll hear from them later on in the series, but there are a number of organizations that are members of Wisconsin Philanthropy Network that are working in the trust-based philanthropy space. There are others who are not necessarily so sure. Uh, I think some of that apprehension lies in the areas of accountability. Um, if you, there's a perception that if you are working inside of trust-based approaches that you're somehow giving up accountability as part of that work because you may not be asking deeper questions. Um, one practical example that I hope you're experiencing in some of your work is grant maker uh, um, content management systems. Uh, the grant application processes that you're experiencing, hopefully, are not being as rigorous as they may have been in the past. That's one kind of key practical example that you're seeing. You're more, you might be seeing more narrative conversations um, that are happening. You might be seeing uh, the rigor of reporting be minimized. Um, hopefully, you're seeing that. And as you're seeing that, you're seeing much more trust-based approaches uh, within the work, within the space that you're working in. Great. Yeah. And this will be a great session. We, we hope you're all coming to that one. Um, the, the full session lists are out there. Uh, we can share them again if needed. But in the interest of time, let's keep pushing through. One, one last thought on trust-based philanthropy. I will just mention that while you may be sitting here thinking, well, that's all fine and good that funders are thinking about that, but I can't control what they decide to do or don't decide to do. I think there are some discussions to be had about what front lines organizations and fundraisers can do to be a part of that movement and sort of push funders to be a little bit more collaborative. So we will address that in that deeper dive session. Um, next slide. Thanks for the link, Mike. Um, so this relates to trust-based philanthropy and even um, questions, I think, of diversity, equity, inclusion, um, and the critiques that ha have been really rising about the old way of doing giving just the role of reserve and unrestricted funds. Um, COVID-19 also really highlighted the way that nonprofits are one fundraiser away from insolvency in many cases. Um, and we have for years heard frontlines organizations complain about the fact that they have to constantly come up with a new project to raise money through grant making or even through direct asks, but that doesn't help them with their general sustainability or operations of things that they're already doing that are good and valuable. And um, this sets organizations up for feeling like they can't take risks or they have to kind of re, you know, put lipstick on the pig of an old program to make it look like a new program or not be as genuine about what they really need funds for. And so ultimately this, this notion of why don't we just say it's not a dirty word to allow folks to have reserves in their nonprofit organizational efforts and why won't funders just go ahead and give some of these organizations unrestricted funds so that they can do the good work that they're doing? And you see these arguments 
um, coming up more and more and more um, by commentators on the sector. And you see gifts happening, I think, more and more in this fashion, which aligns with trust-based philanthropy. You might have seen that bullet on that slide about multi-year unrestricted funds going to organizations where the funder's just saying, you're doing good work, I wanna support it, you're the expert, and we're gonna give you funds to do what you do. Tony, what are you seeing when it comes to this question? So I'm seeing a, a happier positive change. Uh, I think more grant makers are recognizing that unrestricted funding and funding to support operations is, um, is, is an important component for a nonprofit organization to work towards their mission. So I, I'm actually pretty optimistic. A lot of it was, and I know we got a, a later slide about COVID, but a lot of it was driven by COVID, kind of the game changer that COVID became in how grant makers were engaging with their grantees. Um, and so I think that there is a hope that the whole idea around unrestricted funds and supporting operations is a movement that will continue. And then the, the role of reserves, um, the role of reserves is really at the end of the day is about a good balance sheet for the organization. And, and what's a bad thing for that, right? Well, how is that a bad thing? And I think that organizations need to be able to celebrate the fact that, you know, we don't know what's around the corner. We don't know if there's another pandemic or something that's going to happen that we can't predict. And for a lot of nonprofit organizations, if they didn't have those reserves in 2020, they would have really been in trouble. There might've been some significantly more shuttering of doors. And so I think the role of a reserve is really an opportunity for an organization to be able to articulate the strength and the health and vitality of that organization and its readiness as, as that organization moves forward to deal with things that can come down the pipe. Absolutely. And we heard a lot in the early days of the pandemic about funders and fundees having real conversations about the true positioning of those organizations. Yep. Like we're really up against the wall here. And, and that did open up, I think, some more transparency that maybe hasn't stuck entirely, but the conversation did shift. Yes. Um, Greg, would you mind advancing? Okay, so the, the next couple slides, I think we will be kind of buzzing through a little more quickly so we can stay on time. But as you probably already picked up, we're seeing some changes in some giving processes. This relates to the unrestricted multi-year grants that we just talked about, the trust-based philanthropy. But some of the themes here are that funders are starting to realize they need to reduce some of the burdens on applicants and that the traditional metrics and holding folks to metrics might sort of be creating some disingenuousness across the funder fundy relationship. So if the fundies are always being held to meet these metrics or you didn't succeed in the grant, but there actually needs to be a conversation of, you know, that metric wasn't really the thing that would prove our success. Or we realized through the process that we needed to look at this differently. So I think that we're um, seeing some shifts in that. We're also seeing some recognition that if funders really want to fund grassroots efforts that are closest to the communities that are most needing to be in the lead on some of this systemic change, they're not necessarily going to have audited financials and super professionalized organizations. And maybe that's okay. That maybe like lesser standards about some of those things being fully built and suspenders might be okay because the funds will get to those grassroots efforts that really are working in community. Um, so I think there's a shift with giving processes, which we're again going to get to dig in more on in the future sessions. Tony, anything you want to add with that or any examples? No, nope, like? I think you're good. I think you're good on that one, Mary Beth. Okay, great. Um, so this idea of setting up a diversified revenue model is also something we're going to have a full workshop on in this series. But I think that the takeaways and key concepts that we want to be thinking about here, and you can start kind of framing up in your own mind as we continue with this journey together is how do you demonstrate the sustainability of your organization, um, reduce restrictions on the funds that you're working with, have diversified revenue sources that are appropriate for your specific organization? Um, are there any revenue generators that are a little bit more business oriented, fee for service, sales that could fit for your organization? 
And how can you sort of liberate yourself a little bit from some of the funding restrictions that you might be feeling if you're reliant on only a couple of key funders? So we want to help you think about that 360 review of what your mission and what your organization can really see as the right approach to diversified revenue models. And I would reckon to guess that Tony would say that if an organization can do this well, an individual funder is actually going to look at it more favorably because they know that they're not single-handedly sustaining the organization. Tony, would you agree with that? Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, grant makers are looking very closely at the diversified mix of uh, nonprofit organizations with the fear being uh, if you are, if you have a, a significant funder um, that is funding uh, a, a good portion of your operation, what happens if you lose that particular funder and that's where a diversified mix will come into play. Yes, and in the background materials when we get to this session, we'll provide some articles and information about some great examples out there, especially I found in the food systems um, realm, you see some organizations that have done really creative things with um, subsidiary entities that can generate sales, um, vocational training programs that bring in services revenue in addition to traditional fundraising approaches. So we'll give you some examples there that we've written about and reflected on from our center. Um, next slide. So rural philanthropy, I'm actually going to kind of turn this one over to Tony. We've talked about this a lot in Wisconsin, and he has some great insights, but I know it's something that affects all of the world and, and the nation. Um, and I think it's an area that's sort of a being reevaluated um, in many ways. Tony? Yeah, uh, at the recent United Philanthropy Forum conference, which is a conference for organizations like Wisconsin Philanthropy Network, each each state basically has a philanthropy network similar to uh, WPN in their state, uh, as well as other um, national philanthropy serving organizations. At our conference uh, about three weeks ago, uh, there was an actual emphasis on rural philanthropy as part of a tenant that we are understanding that the equity conversation does apply to rural uh, communities, that there are that communities throughout states like Wisconsin are becoming more diverse, uh, that there is a wealth gap that is happening in rural spaces, and rural funders are convening and coming together to get a better understanding around how they can support work that's happening in rural spaces around, around Wisconsin in particular. Um, and so we are focusing on equity, we are focusing on nonprofit capacity building, and we're focusing on mental health, um, health related income, health, health related outcomes for communities, as well as broadband. So it, it's relatively early work uh, for us at WPN. We've recently expanded a number of our members into rural spaces. Uh, so what I what I could what I would tell you is that check back with us you know a year from now we'll, we'll probably have some pretty tangible uh, examples of work and conversations that are happening, but uh, good rural work throughout the state of Wisconsin is being developed. Uh, a lot of it through community foundations that are that are populating state that counties all over the all over the state. Yeah, yeah, and I would say from our center's perspective, what we're seeing statewide and nationally is that. A lot of the rural communities, uh, their economic reality has changed very dramatically and their, their yeah. sort of social capital infrastructure has changed pretty dramatically in recent years. And that um, the notion of having large foundations or corporate foundations in those communities is just not realistic because of the nature of those communities. And so there's a lack of resources. And in turn, some funders are giving that a closer look. and so there can be funders that are really eager to fund rural initiatives. And so we would encourage you to think about how rural philanthropy might play into your mission. And maybe you can kind of use that as a way to, um, you know, be successful in making matches between funders and your needs. Um, next slide. So COVID brought us a lot of lessons. We're running behind. I don't think that this is news to any of you, but I'll leave you with these slides and just, Let's just say for our takeaway here, uh, inequity. Mary Beth, Mary yes. Beth can, I, can I add one thing about the COVID piece? And, and the Wait. only reason I'm, I'm looking to do that is because uh, there was a great conversation this morning. I, I actually came from a meeting with a number of Dane County 
funders um, uh, at our Dane County Funders Roundtable, and we were having a conversation about COVID. It started with a discussion around have nonprofits spent down the COVID funding that they've received from either federal or grant makers. But then the conversation shifted to a broader discussion about what changes um, have grant, the grant makers make through uh, as, as a response to COVID, as a quick response to COVID. And of those changes that they made over the course of the last two years to address COVID specifically, which of those changes are they going to stick with? going forward. And one of the members in the room uh, has said uh, during this conversation that we learned a lot of, we learned a lot about changing the way that we do business as a response to COVID and, and we did things differently and nothing bad happened. So what are we going to stay with as we go forward? So that is an ongoing conversation that is happening within philanthropy as a new response to COVID, which is what's going to stay within the work. Beautiful. So yeah, COVID put some spotlights on some of the gaps in our social infrastructure, our co our interdependence on each other and the nonprofits that serve us. Um, the funder funding relationships changed as we've discussed. Also, philanthropy demonstrated that it was willing to be nimble yes. and go beyond that giving that it's required to do because we saw a lot of emergency funds open up. We saw foundations borrow against their own reserves to give out more than what they were required to. Um, so I think this did open up some of these conversations and this is a really important time as we're kind of two years out from the initial, um, two years plus out from the initial shutdown um, to keep thinking and working forward with some of these themes before we sort of forget about what we learned during the process. So next slide. We're so now I think what we'd like to do is just have you take a break. I'm going to have Greg guide us on the logistics of the rest of the session, but why don't we leave this slide up so that people can be prompted on their break to think about the questions that they might have. And uh, we're going to make sure we don't cut Michael Johnson's time short, and we're going to make a couple of other adjustments to schedule, and I'm going to let Greg share with you about that. But these were our overview comments on the top trends we're going to continue to explore in this session. Um, I'm sorry, in this series, um, each of these items, we're going to get the chance to dig in on more. So we hope you're signed up for the future sessions so that you can dig in with us a little bit deeper on each of them. Greg? Thank you, Mary Beth. Yes, I invite everyone to take, uh, let's say, eight minutes, eight, nine minutes. So come back right about uh, 1243. Uh, stand up, take some deep breaths, use the restroom if you need it, and we will be right back at 1243. Mary Beth, this is where I come on next. Yes, Michael, you'll be, yes. uh, Mary Beth will introduce you and then she will interview you. Wait, right, Greg, so. I'm, I was confused about the timing of that then. Um, we were originally supposed to come back at 1230, so I thought we were gonna shave time off the break, but it looks like we'll be about 13 minutes behind when we come back. So let's just, where are we gonna take that from, the, the Q&A? No, right with you and Michael, and then we will um, we'll disseminate some of the Q&A questions via email if we need to. Right, so Michael will be from 12.43 to, we want to give a full half hour for that, I think. So 1.13, and then we'll have from 1.13 to 1.30 for the Q&A. Q&A, yes. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Sounds good. Thanks, Thank guys. you, Michael. I'm going to take a bio break. All right, same, yeah, I'll <laughs> All right. Hi, Michael. <laughs> Miss you, Don. Yeah, I've been it's too long since I've seen you. you uh, I keep in touch with your good work, though. So, man, you're you're quite a guy. Yeah, we get we got to connect. Uh, so, are you taking uh, meetings, or are you still doing virtual? <clears throat> um, I'm I'm not doing much. Uh, I, I'm I, I had a heart issue, so I can't drive now. So. Okay. Um, we've got a coffee shop near us here. I meet with, with people sometimes, but 
other than that, I don't do much, but I can drive again come September. I'd love to get together with you. Yeah, let's make it. And I want to brief you on this um, workforce initiative we're working on. So you'll hear me talk a little bit about it today. Okay, good, 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 good. Wonderful to see you, Michael. All right, Dominic, man, the connection. I think you should let Michael do the driving. Oh, please. <laughs> I think you should let Michael do the driving, Don. <laughs> yeah, why don't you be my driver, Michael? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll come. I'll come get you. Or we um, can go to the coffee shop in your neighborhood, and uh, sure. yeah, we'll you make that happen. Yeah, Steve. Steve knows where it is, so he can join us. Wait, Steve. I see plaques in the office. You back at work? Uh, no, this is my home office. God, that's a great home office, man. It looks. Uh, I you, want to borrow deal. you want to borrow any of these plants, Michael? <laughs> hey, I know you got millions of them. A couple of them are from you. Is it? Yeah, a couple of them are from you. There's, yeah, I got, I got more over here. Let's see. I'll get one for you. Hold on. <laughs> I love it. Oh, yeah. Hearts for helping. Yeah, pillar of the community. I love it. And that's real. Back in the day. Okay. I'm, I'm well, right. well deserved, my friend. Well deserved. You're the first person to see this. <laughs> you stay busy these days? Only on days that end in Y, like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, all of those days. Yes, I am. Uh, all right. Oh, wow. Don got one. This, I love it. Well, this, uh, um, Steve might have got that minor award, but this is a hole in one trophy. <laughs> I actually got a hole in one, the only one I've ever got in my life, and it was totally a fluke. I love it. I love and no, it. Steve, it wasn't on putt putt. It was a real hole. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've, I've been described as one. Um, <laughs> so we got we got pretty good registration for this event. We got you know between thirty nine and forty five people on the call. It was awesome. Yeah, a lot, a lot of those, Steve, were uh, were people who were presenting and things. Don, Don, yeah, Don, yeah. positive. Well, I, I'm I'm being positive too because we 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 benefit from it. I enjoyed your presentation, Don. Oh, yeah. thank you, Steve. Thank you. Yeah, I'm gonna put this back on the wall. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, Steve, we gotta connect to maybe me, you and. Uh... And uh, Corey get together again, do dinner again. How's he doing? He's killing it, man. Yeah. <laughs> He's definitely taking advantage of uh, all the donors I'm connecting him to. He uh, And getting it on his own, I'm really proud of him. Yeah, you know, I've never seen him in a down mood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He hasn't had the, the, the most uplifting life experience, but he is up all the time. Yeah, he's growing. I'm, I'm seeing him grow as he uh, as he uh, mature his organization. I'm really, really proud of him. Good, good. Yeah, really proud. He's easy to spot in a crowd, <laughs> <laughs> especially with six foot eight. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, you working on any big campaigns right now? Well, I'm helping one city. I'm helping um, Centro Hispano. I'm wow, a volunteer or as a consultant? Uh, uh, volunteer for them and also a volunteer for um, the uh, the hub, the, the Black Workforce Hub that Urban League's okay. doing. And okay. then uh, the um, the Black Chamber of Commerce. Jeez, see, I need a juice, Steve. And then I'm helping Red Caboose raise money for their new home. That, that's as a consultant. Okay. Um, the uh, uh, Union Corners neighborhood, East Wash and Winnebago, not too far from East High School. Okay. And that's an affo a combination of affordable housing and child care. So okay. it's a good project. But most of my time is spent working on a project to bring more philanthropy to support school-based mental health in 421 Wisconsin school districts. That's I love it. I I'm love happy. it. See, see, Don, when I kicked off my $35 million campaign, I came to Steve, told me he was too busy. And man, I'll, I'll be done if uh, if Steve was on my team. Yeah, but some other other uh, projects would have suffered. I think. <laughs> now you where you're supposed to be at, and we're doing okay. Yeah, good. good. Yeah, yeah. We got about um, 
we're at uh, 29 million. So we got six more million to go. That's always the toughest part. Yeah. <laughs> well, 29 million in nine months is not bad. That's very good. I mean, yeah. <laughs> didn't do it by accident. Yeah. 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 And we only did with like eight people. So we don't have a big committee. Just kind of did it with eight people, and most of it was done over Zoom. That's what I can't believe. Oh, wow. Yeah. Amazing. So I was in a, a, a meeting this morning of Dane County funders, and when I put it on my calendar, I put it on my calendar as a Zoom meeting, so I thought I could schedule back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back meetings. Well, this one is over on the east side of town in the American Center down over there. I live on the west side of town, so I had to cancel my other meetings. I couldn't combine this was uh, the first in-person meeting of that group in two years. All the other meetings have been Zoom. So I thought this one was going to be a virtual meeting, which meant I wouldn't have to worry about travel time. And yeah. I realized last night, no, you have to drive your car, Steve, and go over <laughs> to a 35-minute you know, commute. So. Hey, I'm making some of those mistakes, too. People are starting to, I had a donor who was like, nah, no Zoom. We're asking for um, this couple for a big gift. They were like, no, nah, not over Zoom. You got to come out to our farmhouse. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I missed the first one thinking it was a Zoom call and it was uh, actually in person. Wow. Yeah. Well, I'm sure they appreciated seeing you in person. Yeah. Well, actually, it's, it's going to be next week now because I missed it. <laughs> well, I'm sure they did not appreciate your absence. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, hopefully they don't hold it against me. So do you, is your office in the, the Beltline location by Culver's? Yeah, so we were going to, uh, we were going to move it. Uh, it's, it's there. We were going to move it to the new workforce center, but we just had the donor. I don't know if you recall, uh, John Livesey family gave us that. That real estate goes for about $100,000 a year. They gave it to us for a dollar a year for five years. Yeah. So we didn't know if he was going to extend the lease for another dollar a year. So I just convinced him last week. Um, to give it to us for another five years for a dollar a year. So it's going to save us a half a million dollars and, and uh, we'll be, we're going to stay right there. Didn't offer him a tip of 18%. <laughs> I, I, I tried, but he wouldn't take it. <laughs> I'm sorry to interrupt, Steve. Uh, this is actually very entertaining fundraising fodder between the, between the two of you with yeah. these brilliant minds. Uh, we are just coming back from break. Uh, no, we, so, just, we wanted you to let us know. Thank you. Sorry, uh, thank you for sh thank you for just being open with your conversation because it is interesting and there's always takeaways just to be a, a fly in the wall to listen to uh, yeah. two great fundraisers fundraisers speak. So, um, welcome back, everyone. As everyone comes in, I'm just double checking. Uh, Mary Beth, are you ready to interview Michael? Yes, I'm so excited. And I actually just want to say, I don't know how many of you all got a chance to kind of um, notice that our speakers are having a great time catching up on their work in the fundraising field. But one thing we want to nurture through this series is connections across the group of both presenters and participants. We are going to have some opportunities later in the series for things like office hours with some of our faculty. And I would like to take this moment to just ask folks if anyone has an objection to sharing emails across the participants, be sure and let us know because our hope was that we were, would be able to connect you all with that contact information at a certain point in the series. I think we've heard over the years that people like the networking aspect of these events. So we, we were going with the assumption that that would be a part of it. So um, let us know if you have any objection. Otherwise we're gonna be sharing information because there's already been some questions coming my way of, hey, I see this person's here. Can you connect me to them? So we want to be able to do that. So um, I am going to, I think, ask Greg to perhaps take down the slides while I interview Michael, because I think just focusing in on Michael and his responses might be the way to go with this section. What do you think, Greg? I am very happy to do that. And that would be my preference as well. OK. Um, so do feel free to place your questions in the chat if they're arising for you from our earlier uh, talks or as you hear Michael today. Um, we are hoping you thought about that question on the previous slide that asked you, are you seeing some ways that these themes might apply to your actual day-to-day -day work? We realize we're going big picture and a little bit esoteric, but we're hoping you're seeing some connections with 
how you can actually implement some of this stuff and and we'll continue to explore that but um, we'd love to hear from you in the chat about any of that as you think it through um, so with no further ado, um, this may be the, the main event of this session, but we get to hear from Michael Johnson, who if you've been in Madison, Wisconsin in the last 10 to 15 years, you, you may, like me, have been observing the journey of this incredibly successful fundraiser in our community, and it's been something to behold. I think he's used just about every tool in the toolbox I can imagine, and we're going to pick his brain about it today. So Michael, thanks for being here with us today and for being a part of this conference in past years as well. Hey, thanks for having me, Mary Beth and Don and everybody's so good to see you all. I hope I don't put folks to sleep after being on this call for the last uh, two hours. <laughs> I don't know. I think this timing is perfect. Um, so Michael, just to kick us off, you and I have had the, um, I've had the pleasure of having these kinds of conversations with you before. Um, as part of Commons programming, but I love it if we can just go back through what even is your career journey? How did you find yourself in a role where you're probably the most well-known fundraiser in our greater Madison community and you're running an organization that I think has grown significantly during your tenure and that is serving a lot of youth in our community? Can you just give us the Cliff Notes version of, of how you got to this point and what your journey's all been about? The fear of failure is what has helped me, I'll tell you that. Uh, I grew up um, in the projects in Chicago. I was a kid that uh, grew up in the Eisenberg Boys and Girls Club on the west side of Chicago. And um, I knew after graduating from one of the lowest performing public schools in the state uh, that I wanted to be a nonprofit leader. Uh, I was somebody that couldn't read, I couldn't write. It took me eight years to get a uh, bachelor's degree because I had to take two and a half years of preparatory courses at a junior college on the west side of Chicago. I uh, went to school during the day, worked at Boys and Girls Clubs at night, went to work for the Chicago Public Schools, Philadelphia Public Schools, got an opportunity to become um, the Deputy Commissioner of Parks and Recreation uh, for the city of Philadelphia. Uh, then I ran a psychiatric hospital for um, kids in Indianapolis. And then 13 years ago, uh, I got an opportunity to become uh, the president of uh, Boys and Girls Clubs uh, of Dane County. Um, our organization was a small organization of about uh, 18 people, less than a million dollar budget. Uh, we've grown significantly, about a half a million dollars every year uh, for the last uh, 14 years, from about 18 employees to about 200, from serving 1,800 kids to about 7,000 from one facility to about 15 facilities, um, not just in Madison, but Dane County, Walworth County. We have employees that work in colleges and universities across the state. And then uh, in the last um, nine and a half months, we just raised um, uh, $28 million uh, for a workforce center that we're building that's going to be uh, the largest youth workforce center in the history of Boys and Girls Clubs uh, of America. Uh, when I started, uh, we didn't have a lot of assets. Uh, we couldn't make payroll. Um, and we initially grown from about $2 million in assets to ending this year. We have about $30 million uh, on, our, on our balance sheet. Amazing. So let's talk a little bit about the organization that you're running now, Boys and Girls Club of Dane County. What does the revenue model, we're going to get into the tactics of fundraising, but just sort of broadly, what does the revenue model for that organization look like how did you put it together? How has it evolved? You know, have you thought about these questions of like, where can we get some revenue from programs and what makes sense for unrestricted and what makes sense for grants or how has that worked for you all? Well, I lost my hair the first two years trying to figure it out. When I started at Boys and Girls Club, I had a, I had a nice shade of uh, black hair and now it's all gone. Uh, but I would say the first two years was pretty difficult because you know, when you can't you know, pay people, that's very, very challenging. But I really lied on my colleagues and uh, people that was currently working at Boys and Girls Clubs and say, okay, what are some ways for us to, I didn't know one person in Madison, Wisconsin I had came from, you know, the state of Pennsylvania. So I really spent my first, um, my first um, uh, 100 and I would say uh, 80 days uh, meeting with people in the community. I think I met with over 300 people internally and externally um, to try to understand the dynamics of our organization and the issues in our community, but really rely uh, on our workforce to help me to identify 
ways that we could reduce costs, but also bring in new ways of generating revenue. And so uh, my colleagues uh, helped me to identify some cost efficiencies. We redirected those cost efficiencies to hire uh, development people and then aggressively went after grants and uh, capacity building um, grants to help beef up um, uh, our revenue model. We were heavily dependent on government resources. So now you see a mix of grants, special events, corporate giving. Uh, and now that we've built this, uh, we're now raising money for a $20 million endowment. So there'll be a line item that there'll be funds coming in in perpetuity uh, that help um, support some of our programs happening right now, uh, programs and facility fees. But I would say it all start when I look at what our secret sauce has been, it's hiring good people, it's hiring a diverse staff, it's paying them extremely well, it's offering them phenomenal benefits to uh, make sure that you're creating a culture where people feel uh, respected. And then it's being, um, I would say, unapologetic about telling your story, right? Um, you know, sometimes I get criticized by overtly talking about what's going on at Boys and Girls Clubs. My job uh, as the, uh, the, cheerleading, the cheerleader in chief of Boys and Girls Club is to advocate our message, to tell our story uh, in the marketplace, to recruit volunteers, uh, and to be like a coach, right? To develop new talent, uh, to develop new volunteers, to help retain and to keep people focused on young people in our community. And as a result of that, we see our revenue grow every year. We see more kids impacted. We focus on the issues, for example, in Wisconsin, we talk about the racial achievement gap, but there's not too many organizations that can say that they have 700 plus black and brown kids graduating from their program and going on to college at high rates, right? That's validated by a third party study. And so uh, we've just tried to be you know, impactful that while we grow, that our donors know what the return on their investment is. And sometimes when you are as visible as we are, um, people will criticize you, right? People internally sometimes will criticize you. People who you thought were partners will sometimes uh, criticize you. I've learned that in this role, you have to be uncomfortable. And so uh, I've learned to develop thick skin and to leave from an uncomfortable place because it has helped me grow as a leader and also helped our organization grow as a leader. We've gone from about uh, $1,200 to about 36000 And so uh, a lot of people giving us a lot of donations because people see the work that we do in the community and being able to storytell and to be able to share with your donors what you're doing, uh, I would say has really, really helped us um, in our market. Okay, great. You, you're already getting at some of the other questions that I had framed up here, but this is wonderful. So Michael, if I'm recalling correctly, uh, I think it would have been, I don't know, what do you think about 10, 15 years ago that you, when did you come to this role at Boys and Girls Club? Uh, 2010. Okay, yeah, so 12 years ago. And I, I, I don't know if you would agree with this, but it seemed to me from being in the same community that you were able to really take that social media moment where people were paying attention to social media more and more and more and, and use that as a strategy. And I wonder if in the beginning of your time when you came here, you know, just take us back a little bit to when you first landed at Boys and Girls Club and that hair was falling out about the revenue model. Um, what were some of the initial things you even focused on? Because I think a lot of the people in this revenue models and fundraising webinar are probably like, he's at 15 years ahead of where my organization is. And I just wonder if you can kind of talk about like when you were looking at it and you came in new, how did you decide what to prioritize in terms of next steps to build up those other revenue models? How did you use technology for that, et cetera? Yeah, I knew that um, that the way that we were operating was not sustainable, right? And that if one of our uh, government partners went away, it could cripple our organization. We had one big donor that if her family foundation would have left our organization, it would have crippled our organization. So I knew quickly that we had to pivot and we had to quit and we had to pivot quickly. And so um, I think training was important for my team, you know, so my team have gone, my team have gone through 
trainings uh, at the Center of Philanthropy at Indiana University through trainings that you all have taken. I've just taken my entire leadership team through a leadership training at Harvard Business School. So constantly learning and constantly growing. And back then I didn't have a big team, right? It was me and a couple of parts. I didn't have a finance person. I didn't have an HR person. I had like some part-time consultants. So the, the, the burden was on me and a couple of volunteers and some key staff. So I knew quickly I had to build up some infrastructure and that I needed help. And uh, our colleagues identifying, like it wasn't a small budget, but a million dollars is not uh, a lot of money when you're serving 1,800 kids, right? And some people viewed us as a warehouse. I used to, I used to irk me. Uh, our clubs was dark. They were gloomy. And I was like, our clubs should look like country clubs for kids. When kids walk in, they should be bright. They should be clean. They should look just like a country club. And eventually we got there where parents and young people walk in our facilities, they feel proud about what they're in. So that was one thing I really wanted to change, change the mindset of how people viewed us and that people saw that our facilities was a diverse place for all kids um, that were welcome. So we began to change that mindset. Secondly, I knew that I needed a, a, a director of programs to focus on the internal operation, and I needed a director of development to help build up uh, our fundraising uh, capacity. We know that four out of five philanthropic dollars come from individual contributions. So we really focused on developing a, a, uh, a development plan that would uh, bring in uh, more donors to support our work. And then within two years, we hired a full-time development director, a full-time special events director, and we saw unbelievable growth our first, third, or fourth year. Then I would say um, a lot of people may not agree with this strategy, but it has worked miracles for us. Um, we do board report cards. So just like our board do an evaluation on me, we evaluate all of our volunteers. We have 30 board members, and then we have about 78 or 79 committee members. So over 100 people involved in our governance process. When you got 100 volunteers, now I would, if you're a small organization, I would not start off that big. We gradually grew to that point where we, we now have vice presidents who are assigned to a committee. And those 100 plus volunteers help us do amazing things. They help us raise money. They provide intellectual capacity uh, and thought to our organization. They are uh, policy advisors to our organization. And I would say between the internal infrastructure, volunteers, technology, uh, and people, that's been some of our secret sauce at Boys and Girls Clubs. Okay. Sorry for my response. No, you're doing, this is wonderful. Um, and you know that idea of the building up of the infrastructure of the organization to be able to even do development, I think is such an important point that we hadn't really touched on yet today. So you've talked a little bit about telling the story. Um, can you just share a little bit of, more about like, how do you do that? I, 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 I know you do things like spend time with individuals that support the organization, business owners that support the organization, that there's that relational thing that Don was talking about today. I also think you have good materials out there that more broadly tell the story of what you're doing. Um, again, social media, can you just kind of give us a overview of how you get that story out there, how you select which, you can't tell every kid's story or even every program story when you've only got limited time with folks. How do you sort of decide how to focus that and what, what various methods do you use for telling that story? Yeah, I could talk about this for hours because it's just something that I naturally love to do. Uh, but one, we do um, uh, an internal communication with our staff. You know, we do these uh, public these uh, engagement surveys to make sure that our employees are happy about coming to work. And one of the things I've learned from some of the feedback that I've gotten from them over the years is that internal communications is key. Um, so we do an internal newsletter to our workforce. We have internal organizational and operational meetings. I do a newsletter called What's Up Wednesday, where every Wednesday we're communicating um, with our donors, letting them know what's going on um, in our clubs. And those stories come from our staff who feed those up to 
you know, our marketing, you know, department. And then before we even had a marketing department, those stories pretty much came to me and my executive assistant, and we would put those, um, those stories out. Uh, secondly, I use the power of social media. Many of uh, our donors, I have about 30 or 40,000 followers on my personal uh, social media accounts. A lot of them are donors. And I am constantly telling stories about the Boys and Girls Clubs every single day. And a lot of times those stories are fed to me from our staff, some of them, uh, or many of them, when I'm at events, I'm constantly pushing our message. And a lot of times when I go out there and meet with donors, I don't even, I don't even have to sell them anymore because they follow us on social media. So I love what you did with this. I love what you did with that. I may have disagreed with this, but sometimes it allow for a constructive conversation you know, to happen. So if you utilize social media the right, the right way and keep the story focused on your mission and your outcomes and the impact that you're having on the community, you'll be surprised. I've had donors from Florida. I had a gentleman from Baltimore give us $50,000. Somebody I'd never even met was following us on LinkedIn, loved what we were doing around sports and sent us a $50,000 check. So there's a lot of power uh, and utilizing social media to be able to uh, tell your story. Beautiful. Um, as long as we're not too far off of this topic and a question came into the chat, we've got a question about when you referred to the board and committee report cards, how do you conduct those? Are those a self-evaluation or are they evaluated by you or the staff or other board members or how does that work? Yeah, that's a great question, uh, Lisa. Um, so uh, Lisa Fitch, who uh, asked that question, it's kind of a twofold. So first, it's a um, every year, at the end of the year, the end of our fiscal year, all of our board members have to do a self-evaluation based on a template that we've created. But at every board meeting, our board gets an update on how they're performing. Now, we don't, uh, we don't embarrass any board members. So when they see the evaluation tool, um, it'll show board member one through 30. And then there's categories, board attendance, um, committees, uh, how much money they raised or they got, and then anybody that fall under um, whatever the goals are, it'll show up in red and it shows how they're trending. Then at the end of the year, we just look at the data based on each board member and we see which board members are underperforming or overperforming. And what I've learned that those who are underperforming sometimes in that last quarter they will see the results and they will step it up <laughs> those last few months to make sure that they're in compliance. And then some board members who may not be as engaged might say it's probably time for me, you know, to roll off and allow somebody else to be productive um, in, uh, in that seat. So it's something that we manage um, internally, but it's both a self-evaluation. And, and, that, and, and I would tell you, you should not do it um, like our board vice president is our chief engagement officer for our board. So uh, that person is responsible for the engagement. We do all the work, but all, the, all of the communication comes from that person. And I'm willing to share it. Oh, that's great. That's brilliant. I love that you use a VP of your board to be the one to kind of like have the conversations because that that does help address, I think, the sort of peer-to-peer -peer accountability factor. Um, so technology has become, you know, I think, I guess not become, but it continues to be an evolving landscape for all of us and all of our work. Um, I'm kind of curious about how you've dealt with the changes in technology or the technology av available to you in the club as it's grown in your fundraising, how that maybe came into play during the pandemic. Um, do you use a uh, client database software? You know, obviously we've talked a little bit about social media. Um, what's going on with virtual versus in-person? Just any thoughts on the way tech is um, coming into play on your strategies? I do everything on Microsoft Excel. I'm just joking. <laughs> I mean, I, I might be on board with that i don't know cindy was like cindy burton in the green bay was like huh like no don't say that no so we use uh here's what i would say right um uh i've learned over the years at first i was really reluctant to hire an it person 
So it's like I'm, I, you know, when we look at our expenses, I always try to look at revenue generating expenses. But over the years, I've matured to say you got to have strong finance people to keep you out of trouble. You got to have compliance people. You got to have IT people. And I'm so glad we did that many years ago. So you know, we we use Neon as our, our CRM system. Uh, we use Class C to manage our uh, our volunteer management system. And then if you look at Bike for Boys and Girls Club. Uh, we raised $1.4 million on that platform last year, and that's peer-to-peer fundraising where people uh, can virtually ride bikes, come to our bike ride event, and convince their family and friends to be able to do that. And we did that through a, 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 a platform called Classy. It is absolutely amazing. You can see the top 10 riders. You can see the top teams. You can see who have contributed. And then what I love about uh uh, and we also use this wealth management system. I love DocuSign because some of the um, some of the twenty nine million dollars that we raised this year, we formalized some of our memorandum of understanding through DocuSign. So the technology has been amazing. But what I really, really love is that every time we get a donation, whether it's a five cent donation or a two million dollar donation, I get an alert on my email every. Every single donation that come through, I read and I see who's giving it to us. And sometimes I get the email, I get whatever notes they put. And sometimes I'll call a donor and say, thank you. And they're surprised when they get that phone call or they get an email directly from um, the CEO. So that technology for us has been uh, absolutely uh, amazing and uh, it's needed. We look at our donor retention rates. We look at, you know, what time of year our donors typically typically get. Because, you you know, you can, you know, a lot of nonprofits lose over half of their donors every year. And it's easier to retain a donor than to get, you know, a new donor. I would also encourage you, especially the smaller organizations, one of the things that we did, because somebody may say, well, you're a larger organization now. Well, seven or eight years ago, we were a very small organization. And one of the things that we did, Mary Beth, is I looked at some of the expenses that we were currently paying off. And so, for example, uh, we don't pay for marketing services. Uh, he even does that for us pro bono. We don't pay for legal services. We were paying for that. And between a couple of uh, um, legal entities, they provide all of our legal services for free. I look at our landscaping and our uh, snow removal. Olson and Tone provides that for pro bono. And I can go on and on and on, right? We saved about $150,000 to $175,000 the first year, just getting groups to do those things for us for free. And then I was able to redirect some of those dollars to hire development people to help us build up capacity within our organization. Yeah, that is a really good point. A lot of people don't think about the in-kind donations in their pie, pie graph of, of the different revenue sources, but that's one everybody should be thinking about. I'm seeing a couple of questions come in, but I think at this point, I'm going to save them for the end. Um, Michael, one thing that wasn't on our list, but I just want to ask briefly, are you changing the way that you're going about events after the pandemic or special events still a big part of your fundraising plans for the coming years? Yeah, we just had a uh, fundraising. It, we're definitely changing how we uh, run special events. I'm tired of going to chicken dinners, and and we do our fair share. So we do. We now we let this year we did a yoga event, we did a 5K walk and run, we did a bike event, um, and we did a 5K race. This year I decided I said we're going to do a concert, and we had a concert with Gladys Knight, who was an eight-time Grammy Award winner. We had an all-white party, you know, afterwards, and we raised five million dollars. Uh, through a special event. Some of that was some donors who gave us large gifts as part of that event. But now we're thinking about doing a, uh, a, a three-day music festival that I think can raise $10 million a year for local kids in our community. And I've seen them do it in places like Cincinnati and Kansas City. And so uh, we want to be different, right? Uh, chicken dinners are good, but a lot of people do those, right? And so um, we're going to try to pivot a little bit and start doing some of those things. Uh, and then we pivoted from some of the, you know, I'll prefer uh, to ask somebody for $50,000, a couple of people, then it's been six or seven months with 20 people planning an event that's going to net a low return uh, to our organization. 
And so we're, we're thinking differently around that. We also know, I heard Steve Goldberg once tell me that for what, for what much is given, much is due. And Steve, you probably don't even remember telling me that. And when the pandemic hit, uh, we decided to use our platform to raise two or $3 million for 51 other organizations. And we partnered with Selfless Ambition and United Way. And when the week of the pandemic hit, we pretty much went to social media and said, we're concerned about people paying their rent. We're concerned about kids eating in our community. So we launched these food trucks all over the city and partnered with your know, Feed Kitchen uh, from the north side of Madison. We partnered with uh, uh, Chef Dave Hetty and ended up raising a significant amount of money and gave every penny of it away to 51 organizations and felt like, and I had some people in turn like, whoa, we got our own issues. And, uh, and I remember what Steve said, you know, for, for what much is given, much is due. And if you do good in your community and if you do good by others, you will be blessed in the process. And that year we did that, we had our most successful year in the history of our organization prior to the money that we raised this year, which ended up being about uh, 28 million for our workforce campaign on top of us raising $8 million for our operating budget. Yeah, so what I hear from that is, I mean, you're well positioned to do so, but being collaborative in the community, it, it's possible to think about that as a way of also building your own profile. Like all, all boats can be lifted up, right? By some of these collaborative efforts. Yeah. Um, so let's just have you give now, like any final thoughts that you have on tips you'd give folks. One thing we didn't really get into, but I know maybe if I prompt you, you'll share some thoughts about this. This question of like, diversity, equity, inclusion, access. I mean, the mission of your organization sort of has an inherent theme around that that's always been there. But I just wonder if you're seeing any shifts or trends with the way donors and funders are thinking about that, how you use the mission that you're doing to connect the dots for people about why their dollars are supporting some of those themes um, and any other tips you have for folks. And then we'll turn to some of the questions in the chat. Yeah, I just think, yeah, I, you know, I think what frustrates me around this page, some people, you know, I hear them talk about it, but they don't live in. All I see is blah, 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 blah. And I see it even with some of our donors, right? They talk about diversity, talk about equity, talk about, you know, inclusion. You go look at their leadership team. And you don't see any people of color. In some cases, you don't see any any women. And it's pretty it's pretty shameful, to be honest with you. So you go look at our website and you see diversity and you see uh, and you talk to our employees, you see equity and inclusion. You see black people, you see white people, you see Latino people, you see LGBTQ, you see young, you see, oh, you see everything, right? And, and when you have a diverse leadership team, I believe you have a stronger organization, you know, as a result of that. So I think, you know, uh, as the leader of your organization or your division, you got to just live it and hire the right people. Now, that doesn't mean you go and say, well, I'm going to hire somebody Latino or somebody black just to have somebody right. I always tell my team we hire the most qualified candidate, but we do everything that we can to make sure that we that we get the word out and that we get the people encouraged about you know applying uh, within our organization. And so I think because we made some really really good hires, because we do those employee engagement surveys and we listen to the concerns of our employees uh, and that we take care of them. So for example. You know, some people criticize me over this, but our employees get, we, we pay 10% of their retirement plan. Some people are like, oh, that's a Cadillac plan. But if you come work for us and you spend 25 years, you, you deserve to have a decent retirement plan. We pay 90% of your health care premium. If I was in a position, I'm hoping we can get it to 100%. When I started, it was 60, it was 60, 40. We do comp analysis. We look at I don't go by Madison. I go by what what other nonprofits and for profits pay in the region. Because a lot of times we lead, we lose people from the nonprofit sector to the private sector. So my team is highly compensated, and I'll never apologize for that. I'm highly compensated, and I would never apologize for that because that's how you retain people. And this notion of not paying people well in the nonprofit sector is just pure BS, right? You wanna, you wanna, you wanna attract time, attract talent. You have to compensate people well. You have to treat them well, and you have to be inclusive. 
And, uh, and I've just tried to live by that. But also from a governance perspective, right? You hear a lot of these companies talk about inclusion and diversity and nobody on their board is a person of color or they, or they won't even have a woman or a person that's, um, that's LGBTQ. And it's just pretty pathetic to be honest with you. And so representation matters. And then beyond the representation, you gotta live it, right? And you know, in the last year, uh, we had a statue Vail Phillips was the first African-American judge in the state, um, the first uh, African-American woman to graduate from UW Law School. We advocate to have a statue of her at the state capitol. She's going to be the first Black woman in the United States to have a statue um, in a U.S. capitol in the history of this country. We've done the same thing with um, the first Black mayor of the city of Fitchburg. Uh, where they're going to name the city, city chambers after her. And while some people may say, well, that's mission creep of Boys and Girls Club. Why are you doing these kinds of things? Well, both white kids, black kids, uh, Latino kids, monk kids, all need to see people that's reflective of folks in our community that look like our broader community. And there's places throughout the state that's not representative of the citizens uh, of our state. And we have to change that. And so what I've done and I've asked our organization is, let's take Dane County out of our mission statement. Because you know, some people just criticize me. Why are you going to help people in Florida? Uh, there's a hurricane and and uh, we've been everywhere, right? If somebody needs our help in New Zealand, if we need to go and if our community uh, support us, we go and we help kids. So we've been to Flint, Michigan. Every time there's a disaster, a lot of times we step up when Michael Robert, when Michael, uh, Brown was killed. We helped there when Ahmad Avery was killed. We paid for his sister to get her graduate degree. And not one dollar came from Boys and Girls Clubs. We used social media to be able to raise those fund those funds. We helped those families. But sometimes when you step outside your lane and you try to be a bridge builder, you get walked on from both sides of the bridge. And so you just got to know that everybody's not going to praise you um, when you go out and try to do good work. Uh, but you know when you're doing good work, it feels good to get up every day and to make a difference. And that's how I feel in my role. Wow. Well, I, my energy level is higher than when we started this. So thank you for that. I hope everybody else is feeling that way. Um, this is a great conversation. Um, I want to get at some of this enthusiasm and questions in the chat. Um, everybody loves what you're saying about salaries and representation. Um, and we've got some specific questions here on some some of the details you've shared. So somebody asks, Abby asks, can you talk a little bit more about your strategy for when you grew that um, individual contributing donors base? You've talked about it a little bit, but anything more you can add about how you did that? Yeah, so we looked at, uh, we, we originally, I remember when we first started those conversations and that's when we started beefing up our uh, our board and our committees. We looked at who was given to us. And a lot of it started, um, we looked at our year end given, and we used to do these mailers, and they would do about $30,000 a year. Uh, our year end mailer did 700000 last year. And so uh, we started doing a lot of face to face meetings, inviting, I think the What's Up Wednesdays help. Um, we have all the email addresses. Um, a lot of our main donors, uh, anybody that give us $500 or more, they get a direct response for us. Some donors we take cookies to. Uh, I go to I go to everything from farm parties to I've married some of the kids of our donors. I go to barbecues. I've had donors who said, you know, I had one donor like, can you come to Florida? I'm like, God. And then I got a hotel, and they were like, No, I want you to stay with us for three days. And I was like, Oh my God, I didn't want to do it. And now that family is our top donor. And so I would say a lot of it is relationship building, spending time with your donors, getting to know them, but also supporting them and the projects that they're excited about, excited about. And what I've learned a lot of times, I don't even have to make the acts. If I set up a meeting, a lot of times they'll say, what do you need, Michael? And I'll put the number out there and it happens. Uh, but it took, Don brought up a great point, right? I had to earn the right to ask. That relationship over many years, uh, we've gained their trust. We gain their confidence. And because of that, a lot of uh, support comes with it. And once that happens, you are responsible for those investments, right? So then, like, for example, we use UW 
They help us do an assessment of our largest program, which is our college preparatory program, to prove that our kids are persistent, graduating from high school, going to college. Now that we've raised almost $30 million for this workforce center, there's a labor shortage. We're going to help black and brown kids and women get into the trades so they can come out of high school, you know, making $70,000, $90,000 a year. There's some responsibility that comes with those kinds of investments, and people want to know, are you really going to do the things that you say you're going to do? And unfortunately, sometimes, sometimes, some of us will get the money and, 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 have, and have no intentions on really trying to be impactful. So I've just learned if you work hard, work as hard as getting those funds, and then work as hard to be impactful, that that cycle of giving will continue to happen. Beautiful. So another question about, it sounds like you answered the question about direct mail. You all do do a direct mail as a part Absolutely. of your annual, okay, one time a year? No, twice. We do twice one because we run a large summer camp program, so we do one in June. And then our big one is people feel good around Christmas. Now, here's what I would say. Every year, uh, it's a strategy, right? And I get criticized for it sometimes. So we do some crazy things right around Christmas. So last Christmas, we went around town and we gave out two and three thousand dollar tips to waitresses throughout Dane County. None of that was Boys and Girls Club money. We utilized the power of social media, told people what we wanted to do, and we collected about thirty thousand dollars in tips from people who wanted us to bless um, the, uh, people working in the restaurant industry. We gifted uh, and helped one of our employees get a half a million dollar house. Somebody who had been working with us for years. There was a big story on it. None of that came from Boys and Girls Clubs. They were people in the community that wanted to help our maintenance guy live in a better house than I live in. And, and, but he deserved to live in a house like that because of all the years he's given back you know, to this community. And as a result of that, when you do things like that, people see it and then you become top of mind. And they want to contribute um, to you. So we have a whole strategy around what we do over the holidays to help people in the community. And then I would say indirectly, it does benefit Boys and Girls Clubs because people see the impact that we're having in the community. We're first of mind and people contribute to us because of it. Yeah, you're really getting at that theme that Don talked about of the joyful giving experience. Like people are pumped to come participate in these campaigns that you come up with to help people in the community. And then they have a better relationship with you where that cycle can continue. That's yeah, you, you gotta put you gotta put the fun in fundraising, right? Yeah, if yeah. you walk around as the leader of your organization, like, oh, oh I gotta raise a quarter million dollars this year, your team is gonna take on that attitude. You know, we 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 look at it and be like, let's have some fun, let's let's do something creative let's do some crazy ish uh let's sleep on top of buildings let's stay up there all night let's go have a concert and you put fun like this year if you look at our white party and uh, steve was there uh, some of you all were there everybody was dressed in white and we had this group called drew hill came in and people were dancing all night we raised a boatload of money and we partied and we had a good time so sometimes you gotta put the fun in fundraising yeah all right, last two things, and then we're gonna wrap up here. Thanks for all the questions in the chat, and thanks for hanging with these, Michael. Um, do you ever get pushback on the salary levels that you talked about? It feels like that can get caught up in that aversion to the overhead and administration costs. All the time. So yeah. I had somebody recently post I've my salary that. online. Yeah. You don't always get that, but here's the thing. I never pay anybody outside of, like for example, there's a group called Guy Star Candy. They just did the most comprehensive national uh, compensation study in the history um, of any group ever, right? 100,000 plus nonprofits. And every year we look at studies like that and I look at the ranges, include my board who looks at my compensation. I never really pay people outside of the range, but I look at my really good people and say, one, we're never going to pay anybody under the range, right? And then if they're good, we're going to pay them in that midpoint. They've been with us um, over some years. We'll get them to the 70, 90 percentile range. So in my defense, I try to keep my administrative overhead 
best practice between development and, and administrations to be under 30 percent we, we hover around 26 27 percent every year so if somebody have an issue with what my people make i say look you know one we're not depending on you can't compare me to a group like uh, and we, like i think about i think i was um some of the child care facilities uh, they do great work in this community but a lot of those groups may be heavily funded through child care subsidies through state, through pass-through dollars. And in some cases, some of them are 95, 97, 98% funded through government entities. Almost every penny that we bring it through Boise Girls, I got to raise it every single year. So, of course, I'm going to have more development people because if I don't have more development people, I can't bring in resources for kids but we stay within the range of best practice. And I monitor that closely uh, to make sure that we don't uh, go above those ranges. Beautiful, last one. Any tips about those pro bono slash in-kind services like the law firms and the, you know, how did you, any tips for securing those kinds of supports for a nonprofit, especially legal is the question. Yeah, don't be discouraged. You don't get a lot of no's, right? Um, I've had so many people say, no, no, can't help. Not this year. It was too late. Um, just don't be discouraged. Just keep swinging the bat until you hit a home run. Uh, sometimes you might get on base. Sometimes you might get on second base. Sometimes you might get on third base. And some days you will hit a grand slam. That's my advice. Keep swinging. If you ain't swinging, you're not going to get on base. And so that's that's my advice when it comes to that that particular uh, question. Cindy, you agree? You're laughing at me. <laughs> thank you so. Realize. Well, wonderful. Let me just say my quick thanks, Michael. Thank you so much. It's it's really a pleasure. It's been about two a year or two since we did this, and I learned a lot. And I appreciate you and your time so very much. So thank you on behalf of the whole team putting this on. Thank you.